good to hear us, but that he invites us to come. And it's, I just want you today to remember that it's him that we need more than anything else. And it's he alone that we can turn to to find the strength. So let's pray to him this morning and just invite his Holy Spirit and his Holy Presence to wash over us. Lord, we thank you for this chance that we have to come before you. Would you fill this place with your presence? And would you wash us clean today as we come before you, Father, to make us and change us into what you want us to be? You are a great and mighty God. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'm sure that most of you have probably heard the story about the man who was saw a little young boy who was walking down the beach after a storm had come through. And the storm had just washed up hundreds and hundreds of, of starfish along the beach. And the old man was watching him walk down through there. That, uh, and, and as he did, he, he saw the boy reaching down. And every once in a while he reached down, he picked up one of those uh, starfish and... There we go, so now you hear me better. He, and he'd throw it, he'd re, every time he came to a starfish, he'd reach down and grab it and toss it back in the ocean. And uh, the old man looked at him, and he, there were just hundreds of them, and he yelled at the young boy, he said, Son, there's no way you're ever going to make a difference. And the boy reached down, he grabbed another one, he tossed the starfish in the ocean, and looked at the old man, and he said, I made a difference for that one. <laughs> you know, I look at the world around us, and evil can just seem overwhelming. Uh, there's so many issues in society that we're having to deal with from day to day. And as a parent, soon to be grandparent, I was not just worried about the world that my kids are going to grow up in, but now the world that my kids are going to have to raise their kids in is, is getting even more concerned to me. And, and I fear the, the growth that, of evil in our world that our society is calling good. I, I see the potential of societal norms that, that people are just accepting regularly that are outside of God's desires for his people. There are so many problems that we face, and I, I'm beginning to wonder how long it's going to be before God's truth is labeled as hate speech, and that the Bible is, is banned, and that God's people are shunned, not because of what they do, but because of what we believe. And having faith in Jesus as a Savior and not that mankind or science or that a government or someone else is in any way going to be able to save us. And all these potential problems, they, they create a situation where many times what we choose to do is we'll shrink back and we just try to get by in life. We enter into a survival mode of sorts where we're, we're just going to go into our own little cave, we're going to take care of our own little life, we're going to make things as comfortable as we can and just stay right here and just, just take care of me and mine. Have you ever felt that way? Anybody know the feeling that I'm talking about? Well, here's the thing. When you start to feel that way, this is what Jesus says. In this world, you will face troubles. But take heart. Have courage, for I have overcome the world. We need to have courage that no matter what we face, we're going to be able to overcome the world. Because what Paul tells us and encourages us to is not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. And there is a huge, huge challenge in that. We're called to overcome evil with good. And this is not just God saying, be good. This is not God saying that we need to be good little boys and girls and go to church on Sunday, be nice to people and hold the door open and never say anything. That is not what this is about. This is about overcoming evil in the world with good. And so we need to set out not just to be good, but to do good in the world around us. We need to do things in such a way that it will make a difference for our society. Because Jesus wants your life, he wants all of our lives to have significance and purpose. He's called us to be difference makers. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the coming few weeks. And as I look and listen to the world around us, we definitely need people who will step out and be an intentional difference maker. Things are not going in a holy direction. They're going down the hole. And, and we can change it. it. It's been said that the only thing required for evil to prosper in this world is for good people to do nothing. And if we don't begin to act, then we're going to face greater problems. And I don't know, as a matter of fact, I, I, I'm pretty sure about this, but I don't know that us doing things is going to make the world a better place. As a matter of fact, if I understand end-time prophecies, we can expect that the world as a whole is going to actually get worse before Jesus returns. But I, I, so, so my challenge to us is not that we look at trying to change the world, but instead that we choose to be a difference maker who will change someone's world. You see, for that boy throwing the starfish back in, it didn't change the world for anybody except for that starfish. And that's what being a difference maker is really all about. Doing whatever God puts before you for His glory to change someone's world. And we can all do that. We can all be a difference maker who changes someone's world. And instead of just trying to get by in this world, God needs more people committed to being difference makers. And if we change enough other people's world, then the place around us is going to become different. But the place for you to begin to make a difference is right around you right now. 
You don't have to look across the world. You don't have to go someplace else. It's right there in your families as fathers, as mothers, as children, letting God work through us to make our homes God-honoring and life-encouraging. In your workplace, where you go each and every day sharing joy and working with your best efforts as though working for God and not for mankind. Now, or here within the church and in our community as we purposefully serve and we love others, we are called to be difference makers. Will you be a difference maker? That's the challenge. And I want to pray for you right now that you will. Would you pray with me? God, we live in a world that is a mess. We've all sinned. We fall short. Sometimes, Father, we are far too complacent. Sometimes we chase after our own agendas. And God, we know that you've called us to be difference makers. And to, but I pray now that you would teach us how. That you would empower us through your Holy Spirit. And that you would help us to live a life of purpose and impact for your glory and by your power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. People in our world really haven't changed that much in the last couple thousand years. Isaiah wrote in his book, and it's interesting if you go back and you read his prophecy, how he started off talking to a, a nation that at one point in time understood that they were God's people. And technology may have changed and advanced, but our souls certainly have not and as we look at this, I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 1 and just looking in verse 2 and see what God says to these people who are now living in a situation where problems are abounding, they're facing poverty and oppression, and, and, and their leadership was selfish and they weren't concerned for the nation. So, so this is what God says. He says, the children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master care, master's care, but Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Any parent in this room not understand how sometimes your children will look at you and not understand how much you care for them, how much you do for them. It's like they still believe in magic. They will open the refrigerator door, not see what they want, walk around the kitchen, come back, open it like it's going to magically appear. Uh, or, or perhaps they will ask you for something and you give them a little money and they go away and they think that magically they can come back and you're going to have more money in your wallet that you just gave them what you had. It is, it's funny how they just believe that they can get more and more and that they don't understand it. And that's exactly what God is dealing with right here. God says, he goes on to say, what a sinful nation they are. They're loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil people. Now, maybe you've never looked at your kid and just one point said, you are evil. You may have thought it. <laughs> Some of you may have said it. Uh, but, you know, but how about this? God just calls them right out on them. They are evil, corrupt, and they have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. You know, it's funny to think about our kids doing that to us, but doesn't that sound like us before God? Have, have we really changed that much? He goes on in the following verses to point out the problems that they're facing, that people are, are hurting, that there aren't enough resources within the nation of Israel to meet everyone's needs, that cities are, are battlegrounds and that people are oppressed and, is, and are hurting. And, and, and I look around and it's like, man, we face the same problems today. They're still going on all around us, and, and our government keeps offering solutions. They'll, they say how they're going to fix things, and they'll send a stimulus, and they'll promise justice, and they pray, God bless America, and they ask us to all pull together. But the problem is that they don't really understand the problem. And Satan is continuing to work to keep us distracted from the real problem. He'll make you think it's the other political party. He'll make you think it's the elites who control all the media. But our problem isn't against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against them, but against the dark spiritual forces in this world. You see, the problem is sin. Pure, straight, and simple. They are evil people. And sin is keeping us from being the difference makers that we need to be in the world. And the thing is, it's not just sin in everybody else. It's sin in us that is the biggest problem. And when God called his people, he said, If my people call by my name will turn from their wicked ways and, and, and come to me, then I will hear their prayers and will forgive if my people will turn. And see, the problem isn't sin or evil in the world. This world is going to have lots of evil with it. The problem is when God's people have accepted evil and are committing it themselves. And so in verse 16, God begins to lay out the plan. Here's how you've got to deal with it. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Three steps. We're going to share them with you today. You should be able to follow pretty easy. But he starts off saying, wash yourself and be clean. Get your sin out of my sight. 
Here it is. Stop doing evil. That, that's not real hard to understand, is it? It's pretty clear, straightforward. Stop doing evil. And that's it. And this is like God standing at the top of the steps, yelling at the kids in the basement, cut it out, don't make me come down there. Then here, here he is. And, and the thing is, we keep making excuses. And we need to quit making excuses. We need to quit trying to justify our sins and our choices. And instead, we need to repent and stop doing evil. And it's simple. It's just not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. It's, it's, I, I, I joke about this sometimes. Rhoda's always asking me, it's like, you said you're going to quit drinking Diet Mountain Dews. Um, and, and I keep telling her I will, and, 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 but it, it's kind of hard. And, and, and the truth is, I will eventually stop drinking Diet Mountain Dews. Probably about the first time I get a huge kidney stone and I'm lying on the ground crying because I'm trying to pass this kidney stone from having so much uh, acid in my system from these things is when I'm going to quit. And the thing is, when you say, well, that's silly, but how many of us wait till sin has driven us to the ground and we're crying on the floor before we'll start to think about changing our ways? You see, that's what we do. We, we keep trying to hold on. At least soft drinks aren't morally sinful and evil, but we all face temptations that are driving us every day, and Satan knows your weakness. Satan knows your weakness, and he knows my weakness. And, and my temptation may be different from your temptation, but my temptation is no less tempting to me than yours is to you. And that's what Paul's meaning when he writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has seized you except for what's common to man. You see, we all deal with temptation, and it will hit us, but it hits us the way that we're weak. Satan knows how to drive you to your knees. He knows how to cause problems for you in your life. And it's so easy for us to look at the problem somebody else is dealing with in their life and say, well, I'm not like them. But then they'll look back at us, and they'll see the problems in our life and say, well, I'm not like them. And all of a sudden, we all start to feel pretty decent about ourselves. But the simple fact is that while no temptation is seized us except what's common to man, we all deal with temptation. But this is the promise to each and every one of us, that God is faithful and he'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. You see, the problem is that when I'm tempted, it just seems like too much for me sometimes. And, you know, the last year, probably one of the greatest temptations I have faced is the temptation of complacency. Just, you don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when this is going to alleviate. You don't know when we're going to be able to move forward. Just, just sit back. Don't worry about it right now. And it's really easy to sit back and just let life happen around you and forget that God has called us to make a difference in the world. And so as I preach this series on being a difference maker, I'm not just preaching it to you. I'm, I'm preaching it to myself that I need to live it and quit being complacent. And you may think that your sin is worse or harder or different, but the simple fact is that your sin is no less damning and no, than my sin is. They affect us the same. And so the bottom line is, regardless of what you're dealing with or what I'm dealing with, we can't slough it off. We can't make excuses. The simple response is to stop doing it. Evil. And God will provide a way out. He'll give us the strength and the support and the help that we need. And one of the greatest ways He does that is through the church. He'll surround you with people who will support you no matter what you're going through and try to encourage you so that you can deal with the temptations that you're facing. But so many of us, we don't want to let anybody know that we're weak. One of the greatest charades and, and one of the greatest temptations that Satan will pull out on you is to try to tell you that, that you don't need to tell anybody else that you have problems, that you're struggling with something. You're the only one that deals with that. That's why Paul just simply says, no temptation sees you except for what's common. You're not the only one. You're not alone. And not only is Jesus going to be beside you through whatever you face, but he's put a church here that will be with you to help you deal with the problems that you encounter in life, to give you strength to overcome things. And as we try to change our life, and as we try to stop doing evil, it, it very well may mean that you have to change some of the places that you go. It may mean that you have to change some of the people that you hang out with. It means that you need to pick your battles a little more carefully in life because you know there are some that you won't win. Look, I grew up and, and, and I, I never lost a fight, but I, I chose to walk away from several. And that's still my greatest saving grace to this day is that there's places I won't go because I know that I will 
give in to the temptation. And there's times whenever I'm going to be going someplace and I know that I've got to have a brother beside me who can stand beside me that's going to hold me accountable so that I don't give in to certain temptations. We need that. But God's got a second step. The first step is, is real clear. Stop doing evil. Step two is just as clear. Learn to do good. Start doing good. Your Christian walk should never be defined by what you don't do. I grew up with hearing the phrase, don't cuss, don't drink, don't chew, and don't date women who do. Now, that's a good advice, but that is not scriptural. That's just good advice for life in general. But so many people have evaluated their Christian life on what they don't do. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't cuss. I don't do drugs. I, I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't lie. I, I don't womanize. I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm a pretty good person. But when you really look at their life, you're also going to notice that they don't care, they don't love, they don't give, they don't help, they don't do anything for God's glory. Your Christian life should never be defined by what you don't do. What we're called to do is replace evil with good. That's what a difference maker does. And that's what God says to do. He says, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. He says, do something good. Replace the evil that you're going to stop doing with something good. And here's the great news. This isn't like we're trying to replace cupcakes with kale on a diet. We're going to find there's a lot of good things out there for you to replace the bad stuff with. There's, there's so many great things that God has called us to. And he does say, protect the innocent, the widows, and the orphans. Help the oppressed, the people who are made in God's image, who, who need to be loved. But don't just, now here's the thing, you can't just choose your social justice cause and, and join it in our society. Because our society is so messed up that there's a lot of well-intentioned groups out there wanting to make a change and they're wanting to make things better, but they don't honor God. They don't put God first. And what they're trying to do is make the world a better place to leave God out of it. And when you do that, the world is not going to become a better place. And that's what, that was part of God's issue. It, when he spoke to prophet Isaiah, and he's telling the people, he says, you come to me, you worship me, you, you bring these sacrifices, you do all these things, you cry out in my name, but, but you don't honor me. He says, I'm sick of what you say you're doing to make things better, because this isn't it. And some social justice causes will pervert God's character to defend their choice. And you've got to understand that God's grace and his love always flow out of his holiness. If you read in the book of Revelation, as the angels and the saints surround the throne of God, they cry out and they sing to Him, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, Bible writers, they didn't have bold and italics and, and you know, words that could pop up on the screen to draw attention to it. So when they needed you to pay attention to a word, they repeated it. And it's not just holy, holy is the Lord God. This, you get a three feet here. They're saying, pay close attention to this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God's primary characteristic is His holiness. And they want to emphasize that. And I know God is love, but they don't sing out, love, love, love is the great, is the Lord God Almighty. They don't, they don't sing out, grace, grace, grace is the Lord God Almighty. They don't cry out, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. But what they cry out is they sing, holy, holy, holy. And God is love, and God is grace, and God is forgiving. But those things flow out of His holiness. And God's love and grace and forgiveness will never allow sin to pervert His holiness. And we've lost that somewhere. People don't understand that. You see, God is holy. And so, before we can do anything in this world that's really going to make a real difference, it has to flow from the holiness of God. And, and it is God's very presence that drives away all things and, and makes things holy. It's in Him that things become holy. And so before you go out and you, you become a difference maker, you've got to understand that before God can do anything through you, that first you've got to allow Him to do something in you. Before God can do anything through us, He's got to do something in us. And that's why, listen to what He says to Isaiah in verse 18. He says, come now, let's settle this. Let's put an end to it all. Here we go. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me and listen. Here's what he's going to say. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I will make them as white as snow. See, God's saying right here, 
that you need to stop doing evil, you need to start doing good, but you will never be made holy by yourself. It is up to God, and He is the one who will make you holy. I will make them white as snow. So how do you deal with the real problem of sin that, that's in us? Well, we have to go to God through Jesus, who is our sacrifice for sin, and then we have to humbly seek God. We don't need more books written uh, uh, with laws in them telling us what we need to do. We don't need more people out there spouting their opinion about how we need to live. Instead, what we need is more of God in this world, but that happens by having more of God in our lives, and we've got to begin to trust the cleansing power of God that changes. And then we can be a difference maker and change someone's world. You know, I hear people say that our world is getting colder and darker. And I believe it's true, but did you know that you can't really measure darkness? You can't measure cold. Cold and dark don't actually exist. They're expressions that describe the absence of light and the absence of heat. And so when we say that our world is getting dark and cold, what we're really saying is that there's not enough light and heat. Jesus spoke to his followers. He said, you are the light of the world. If the world is getting dark, it's because Jesus' disciples aren't being the light. If the world's getting cold, then it's because we have let the Spirit's fire be quenched. So we've got to come to Jesus. We've got to come to Him to be renewed in our hearts and have a relationship set right with Him to be changed from the inside out. And then that's how the world around us begins to change as well. Jesus warns the church in Revelation 2 not to forget the love that they had first. How many of you can remember a point in time when the Spirit's fire was so bright and so hot in your soul that it, it just people will say there's something different about you? But it's fading. When Moses came down from meeting with God, the brilliance of who God was made his face shine in such a way that, that the people had him wear a, a veil. As time went by, though, the, the shining light of Moses' face began to dim, but Moses kept wearing the veil so that he looked the part to everybody else. But the truth is that if we're not spending time with God, our light goes dim. And so I want to challenge you today. Will you set yourself to be renewed by entering into God's presence? Will you commit yourself to inviting God to change who you are, to make you different from the inside out, and let Him begin to change not just your life, but the world around you by His work in you? Because before we can make any real difference, we've got to let God make the difference in us. And we're going to close today with the time of communion. And as we, as we partake of communion, I'm going to sing a song this morning that uh, I hope you all enjoy. We're going to use it as a theme song throughout this entire series. It's just called Different. But I want you to think about and use this as a time to, to pray and ask God to begin to make things different in your life. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would begin to make a difference. I pray, Father, that today you would begin to make a difference in me, that I can be yours and that you can make a difference through me in this world. Lord, it is my prayer for each and every one of us that we would choose to be above everything, a difference maker. That we wouldn't just be satisfied with being good, but that, Father, we know that we can step into this world and that we can do good for your glory. And we can help people to grow, to find hope, to deal with the problems in life that we bring. And that God, as we, I, I pray that during this time of communion right now, that in each of our hearts and our lives, that we would find your spirit and open ourselves up to your spirit to allow you to change us from within. As Jesus died on the cross, Father, he, he took away all all the sins, and it's there that you made our sins as white as snow. And so, Father, would you please, would you please cleanse us today? Make us right and make us holy by letting us in and allowing us to come to you. And I pray, pray, I do pray, Father, that you would make a difference in us. We love you, Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't want to hear anymore. Teach me to listen. I don't want to see anymore. Give me a vision. That you could move this heart to be set apart. I don't want to recognize the man in the mirror. And I don't want to trade your plan for something. I can't wait.
can't stay the same. Wanna be different, wanna be changed till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright the whole world can see that there's something different. So come and be different in me. I don't want to spend my life stuck in a pattern. I don't want to gain this world to lose what matters. So I'm giving up everything because I want to be different. I want to be changed till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright the whole world will see that there's something different so come and be different I know that I am more perfect through you the cross I'm worth it. So take this thing in my heart and come finish what you started. They see me, let them see you. So I want to be different. I want to be different. I want to be changed. Till all of me is gone and all that remains. Come and be different. I just want to be different. Don't make the difference in me. And Father, that's our prayer today. That you would make us different. That you would change us from the inside out, God, to become everything that you want us to be. That you would take these dead, broken hearts and give them new life. That we'd be renewed in your presence and that, Father, we would be everything that you want us to be in this world and that, Father, you would use us to truly make a difference. Help us to be the difference makers that you need in this world. And let it start in us and in our families this week as we just set out to purposefully love and to be intentional about being everything that you want us to be, God. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the back of your sermon notes this morning, you'll see a notice about a new ladies Bible study going to be launching here in a couple of weeks. If you would like to be a part of that study, it'll be happening here at the church live at 6 p.m. on Wednesday nights, but also be a Zoom study that you can call in for and be a part of that through the Zoom study at the same time as there will be a live group here. Um, and so if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, please let Rhoda or Delana know, and they will help make sure that you get a book for it. Um, and we're just looking forward to being able to have that study as we launch into some new ministries in the near future. Uh, we're so glad to have each of you here with us this morning. I invite you, if you would, to stand with us as we close out. We will be having our men's group study tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, teams will continue to meet here at the church on Wednesday nights at 6. Uh, and we're just looking forward to hopefully spring and, and breaking for us each and every day just a little bit nicer. But let's, as we head out, let's sing this wonderful song and asking God uh, to change our hearts and give us new life. I search the world
see you next Sunday. May God use you to make a difference this week. See you later.